Good morning. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. We've completed chapter 1 of Mark. We're into chapter 2 now, just starting chapter 2. Let's hear the word of the Lord. We'll read verses 1 through 12. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the... Tremendous privilege we have of gathering together with your people to seek you and worship, confident that you are present with us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which is able to instruct us in your truths, to lead us in our lives, which is able to bring life to the dead by the power of your spirit at work through it. And we ask, Father, now that as we look at this text, that you would open it, open it up to our hearts. Give us eyes to see and grace to comprehend what's in your word. Bring about salvation to any here who do not know you and great encouragement to those who do. Please be gracious to us. Please forgive us for the ways in which we've sinned against you this week and this day. And we ask now for the blessing of your Holy Spirit to be with us in this place. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Having completed the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, we have already begun to see how the authority and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ have been thoroughly authenticated. He has exercised power over demons. He has exercised power over all manner of illnesses. He was able to cleanse a man of his leprosy, a disease that is wholly incurable by man at that time. This Jesus was certainly the Christ, the promised Messiah from of old, and the Son of God, as Mark has declared to us in verse 1 of chapter 1. Well, this morning, Mark will now hone in on another miraculous sign that the Lord performs as he raises up a paralyzed man, miraculously healing and strengthening his muscles and bones such that he is able to function according to God's original good intentions for the body. That said, we will also witness something quite unique about the way in which the Lord performs this particular miracle, showing that he not only has power and authority to heal all sicknesses, but furthermore, even more profoundly, that he actually has the authority to forgive sins. We have already witnessed him healing leprosy, an act that only God could do, but here we will also see how he is able to pardon sins, a privilege that belonged to God alone as well. All in all, we see very boldly here that this Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And so look with me again at the first five verses of our text. We're told that when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. 
And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they laid down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And so having made his way through various cities of Galilee, he was circuiting the cities of Galilee, preaching the gospel. We're told that at some point the Lord then returned back to his home in Capernaum. Word then went out that he was at home, and as would be expected, a large multitude of people had flocked to him, filling the house that he was in, we're told, all the way to the door and beyond, so that there was no more room for anyone to gather. So there was a large crowd spilling out of the house, into the yard, out of the door, so that no one else could gather. And we're told that he did what he came to do. He preached the word to them. Now before we move on to see what happens, let me add another important piece of information, something important to take into account here, which will help set the tone of understanding how our Lord responds to what happens in this event. There's a reason why in this particular event he responds the way that he does. And part of it has to do with what is going on here. Among those who were present there in the home, we're told seating there in the Gospel of Luke, there were many Pharisees and religious leaders who were sent from all directions to observe his teachings and his actions. So there were a lot of the religious leaders present there. In Luke's account, chapter 5, verses 17 to 18, we're told these words, same, he's speaking of the same event. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, so Pharisees and scribes, were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. So you have, remember, the Pharisees are the teachers. Those are the ones in the synagogues who teach. They're like the pastors, if you can say, of that time. And they came from every village of Galilee, broader in Judea as well, and then also from Jerusalem to Jesus there in the home. This is Luke's preface to the event that we're here considering in Mark's gospel. And so note for the time being that several Pharisees and scribes from several different locations were present when this event had taken place. That's important. And no doubt they were watching him closely with the intent of reporting back to the rest of their ilk. So they usually would go as they did with John the Baptist and as they do with Jesus they would want to hear him, they wanted to get information from him, perhaps catch him in some kind of error, and then report back to those who they uh, had gathered with. Well, that said, let us now turn our attention to the actual event that takes place while the Lord is at home in Galilee. As the Lord is preaching, we're told, there are four men carrying a paralyzed man, so probably one in each corner, almost like carrying a, a gurney. They carry this paralyzed man toward the home where Jesus was, but they were kept from bringing the man to Jesus. They wanted to see, uh, to have this man healed, and they were kept from getting to Jesus because there was a large crowd overflowing beyond the door of the house. There was no way in. However, rather than give up or turn away, being determined to get the man to the Lord, they consider other means of accomplishing their mission. And so they are confident that Jesus can heal this man, so much so that they will do anything to get him to Jesus. They know he is able, he is capable, and they must get this man to Jesus. And so what do they do? They make a way through the roof of the home. Now, it wasn't uncommon in the first century to have an accessible roof on your home. I don't want you to think in terms of our roofs that we have today, which we don't generally access unless somebody's cleaning out the gutters or fixing something up there. It's different in that day and age. Their roofs were accessible and they were used oftentimes as additional living spaces. Spending time on your roof was a common practice among the people and it might be considered in the same way uh, that we would spend time out on a deck or on a porch or on a terrace. 
But the man labored tirelessly to get this paralyzed man up onto the roof. That was a work in itself. But then they begin to pull apart the tiles on the roof, forming a large hole whereby they can lower, lower this man on his bed down to the Lord Jesus Christ through the roof. And so the commotion, you can imagine Jesus is preaching in this home, packed with people all over the place. And there's a commotion, you can imagine the roof being opened up. This man is lowered down, it gets the Lord's attention, and he observes the man as he is gradually being lowered to where he is. And then, we're told something quite profound, which bears our consideration to start out here. We're told that when Jesus saw their faith, plural, their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now the whole notion of Jesus meeting the faith of those whom he heals, right? Oftentimes he might give instructions, not always, and say, go wash or go do this. There was some element of faith that he required in some sense. And he would often meet that faith by healing the individual um, throughout the Gospels. We see that at times. And that's, so that's not an uncommon reality. However, what's interesting here is that we're told that upon beholding their faith, that is in the plural, that is in the men lowering him through the roof, going to the extent that they did, that Jesus then responds, forgiving the paralyzed man his sins. And so here in this context, Jesus is responding to the faith not only of the paralytic, but perhaps even of greater emphasis the men who had carried and lowered the paralytic through the roof to Jesus. He beheld and was moved by the extent that these men had gone to ensure that this man who was incapable of getting Jesus to Jesus himself, that they would get him to Jesus. He beheld their resolve, their urgency, their unwillingness to give up, their fervency, and their overall determination to set this man before the Lord, all of which had indicated the certain and deep confidence that they had in the Lord's ability to make this man whole. Those men had faith, and the Lord was moved to respond to their faith when he had shown mercy to the paralytic. Now for a moment, brethren, I want you to consider the implications of what we're told here, because I do believe there's an application here for us. Are we saying that sinners can be justified and saved on the basis of the faith of others? Well, we're not saying that. That's not, I don't believe that's the purpose of what we see here. That would be to introduce a new doctrine that is contrary to the very personal emphasis of the call of the gospel for all to believe into Christ. Everyone must have their own personal faith in Christ to be saved. We know that through the clear teachings of Scripture. And so we don't want to take this and stretch it beyond uh, against the other Scriptures, clear scripture, teachings of Scripture. To be sure, no one ever made it into heaven's gates by the apron strings of someone else. But what then can we rightly take from this text? Because it is unique. Well, brethren, I believe that we have here a profound example of the power of intercession. A profound example of the power of intercession, compelling us to realize the significant value of our fervent prayers on behalf of others, and especially as well on behalf of those who are in some way limited in their ability to come to the Lord themselves. And here are two ways that I think we can apply this, one more narrow and one more general. First, we have the great motivation here to pray for those, I believe, who are disabled in some way, mentally disabled perhaps, bound to an unconscious state, or because of some limitation in their mental faculties, are simply incapable of responding to the gospel themselves. We, we know many people who are in those kinds of, uh, that kind of circumstance who are mentally disabled in some severe way and cannot even really comprehend what we try to teach them about the gospel. 
Well, God can use our fervent intercessions in such a way that he would, by his spirit, grant faith to those for whom we are praying. It's no more of a miracle for somebody who is extremely retarded to believe the gospel than it is for us who are dead in sin likewise to believe the gospel. And sometimes we could just assume and write people off in that state. And so I believe we have great encouragement here to pray and intercede for such individuals. And our text bears that out. The intercession on behalf of someone in this case who could not walk physically to get to Jesus. But secondly, brethren, I believe there's another great general motivation here as well. A great motivation teaching us to persistently pray for those who are dead in their sins. Those who are incapable of coming to the Lord on their own because they're dead in their sins. Trusting that God will make use of our prayers in the calling of spiritually dead sinners to himself. He uses our intercession for others, not simply on people being physically made better. We do that. Not simply on God strengthening others who are in the faith, but also in the actual bringing about salvation to others, God uses our intercessory prayers. In other words, even the general work of fervent intercessory prayer here seems to be magnified by our text. And so, brethren, I say this to encourage you to recognize that your prayers for your loved ones count. They, they, they are meaningful. Keep praying. Keep praying with confidence that God hears and that he is able to turn their wayward dead hearts to himself. We see our loved ones or others that we know of sometimes and we, we begin to think that there's no hope for them. They're so hard to the gospel. They're so resistant to the gospel. They don't want to hear it. They want nothing to do with it. We can't speak to them anymore about these things. We have to be quiet because we don't want to overdo it. Well, we can take the energy that we want to use in speaking to them and we can knock on the heaven, uh, throne room of heaven and plead with God on their behalf. It may seem impossible, but as was the case for you and I, Salvation is of the Lord. He must regenerate. He must replace the heart of stone with the heart of flesh. He must save. And he can and does and will. But he also makes good use of the fervent prayers of his people to this end. Again, we don't see that happen. We don't pray and see some kind of material come out of us and go up and God use it in some way to save. We don't see that transaction, but he uses our prayers to bring the lost to himself. And so let this text compel you to pray and to pray without ceasing for your loved ones, pounding on the throne room of heaven, never giving the Lord rest as it were until they're all safely in the arms of Christ. What a motivation to come and to gather with the people of God at the prayer meetings and to pray in this way. Or if you're at a great distance to even join us through Zoom. What a motivation to pray together. What if we all, brethren, continually filled the throne of God with our praying voices? Week after week together, confident that our Heavenly Father hears us. Praying also for the lost, knowing that God hears and uses our prayers. Might he not look down upon our faith and say, Behold the faith of my beloved children at Sovereign Grace Church. Behold their fervency and their consistency. They keep knocking, they keep asking, they keep seeking. Let us go down and honor their entreaties. Would we be surprised by that? If God should do that, I want to encourage those who have been coming out to the prayer meeting to keep coming, to never diminish the value of your presence there because that is, that is the tendency and it will happen. There'll be times when you'll be too busy and it will seem like it's so insignificant what we're doing because we don't see the tangible ways in which God is using our prayers. But we need to be fervent in our praying and confident that every seed that we sown in some way God is using for his glory. 
What if God were to say to our church, let us give them souls, even the souls that they plead for. You see, brethren, this is why I believe God will do that. He's sovereign. He'll save who will save. But I believe the greater miracle is the people of God being consistent and praying together. If that's achieved, I inevitably know what God will do in bringing about revival and healing and restoration. It begins with that that conviction, that fervency, that faith that comes in, in prayer and being determined to bring people before the throne room who need that intercession. When he saw their faith, he turned to the paralyzed man and pardoned his sins. Well, brethren, this then leads to the peculiar way in which the Lord deals with this paralyzed man. It's it's, it's interesting how he handles this man. Again, uniquely, on this particular occasion, the Lord doesn't initially heal the man. Right? In a lot of occasions, the Lord does something, the man's healed. But in this occasion, he doesn't initially heal the man. First, he forgives the man his sins. And indeed, the man is still as paralyzed as he was from the outset, from a physical standpoint, but his sins are forgiven by the Lord. So he forgives him, but the man is still paralyzed, isn't he? He's not getting up at this point. And certainly, him being forgiven really ought to suffice, don't get me wrong. But there's another critical reason for why the Lord deals with this man in this particular way here. And it comes back down to recalling as well what I said earlier. That many of the Pharisees and scribes from all directions were present seeking to catch the Lord in some moral wrong or error. So the Lord is dealing with others in the use of this man as well. Sometimes we may forget that as well by way of short application. That the Lord is often doing multiple things beyond what we might think in our circumstances than just our own needs. God is often doing so many things. And here the Lord will challenge these religious leaders and he will affirm that he is who he claims to be by affirming that he is indeed, like his heavenly Father, able to actually forgive sins. He could cleanse leprosy. He could heal all illnesses. He could cast out demons. And he could forgive sins. He has the authority to wipe the slate of man's guilt completely clean. And so here the Lord pardons the sins of this paralyzed man. Well, with the man still laid up in his paralyzed condition at this point, there was a stir among the Pharisees and the scribes as they consider those pardoning words of our Lord to the paralytic. So there's some uneasiness there. They're not venting it outward, but, but you can see that in some way there's a stir. There's something going on. You can see it in their eyes, as it were. And so in verses 6 and 7, we're told, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they're all thinking along those lines. Conversing within their own hearts and minds, they consider the Lord's statement to be blasphemous. Ironically, they'll be the ones who blaspheme the Spirit. But they consider those statements to be blasphemous because God alone is able to forgive sins. And so a major point of contention with the Lord is beginning to develop within their hearts. And if you think about it for a moment, whoever in the history of God's people has ever taken it upon themselves to pardon sinners of their offenses toward God? What gall? What presumptive boldness? Noah, Abraham, Moses, all of the prophets of old, none of them would ever dare do such a thing. That's a prerogative that belongs to God alone, who is the holy offended party. And yet this Jesus claims to have such authority. Well, when you are the one who will bear those sins, 
and absorb the penalty due them. And when you are the son of the living God in truth, uniquely, that can certainly set you apart from every other, even godly human being that has ever walked the face of the earth. But that said, the reason for the Lord's delay here in not healing the man yet concerning healing this leper is found in his follow-up response to the religious leaders as he recognizes that in their hearts they were embittered and they were challenging him. Because if the Lord were not in the possession of the authority to forgive sinners, God would certainly not empower him to heal this leper after making such a bold and direct statement, would he? He said, this man's sins are forgiven. Now he's going to use the power of God to raise this man up. That's not going to happen unless he really has the authority to forgive sins. And so what follows is a most certain declaration from God himself affirming that Jesus does indeed have the authority to forgive sins. Look at verses 8 to 12 with me for a moment. And immediately... Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question those things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And so getting a sense of the uneasiness of the hearts of those religious leaders, the Lord then challenges them. And in essence, he says this, look, you have an issue with me forgiving this man's sins. You claim that I am blaspheming God by doing that. What do you think is easier, to make such a statement as that or to authoritatively exercise the power of God onto the healing of this man by commanding him to take up his bed and to walk? Which statement do you think would most convince you that I have indeed been sent by God? Charging a paralyzed man to actually get up and walk from an observational standpoint would be much more difficult, wouldn't it? If I can miraculously heal this man and make him whole again, as I've been doing in the cases of other sick and demon-possessed individuals, that ought to be sufficient to overcome all of your doubts about me and to remove every excuse for your rejecting me. But all the more now see so that you may know that the Son of Man, the anointed one sent by God to represent and save man, has authority on earth to forgive sins. Watch this, he says, as it were. And then he turns his attention toward the paralytic and commands him, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And of course, affirming the divine power of God upon him and thereby affirming Christ's authority to forgive sins. The paralyzed man, we're told, immediately gets up, picks up his bed and goes home. And the Lord leaves a most powerful testimony for the religious leaders from all different parts of the land to take back to their ilk. They are without excuse. Of course, Rather than get the actual point, having to account for the fact that he had exercised supernatural power, which would support and authenticate everything that he taught, including his ability to forgive sins, they come up with the ridiculous notion that he had drawn such supernatural power from Satan rather than from God. We're going to see that at the end of chapter 3. And they who accuse him of blaspheming God blasphemed the Holy Spirit, as we'll soon see. This is a critical truth that Mark will reveal to his audience, especially with they, as they begin to wrestle with the rejection of Jesus.
from the standpoint of the Jewish religious leaders. Remember, Mark and all of the gospel writers, they're affirming the authority of Christ. They're affirming his office of Christ. They're affirming his divine sonship. But they also must deal with the contention of the religious leaders because there's a wholesale rejection of Christ on behalf of the majority of the Jews, specifically the religious leaders of that time, and that needs to be explained and dealt with. And so our text concludes by telling us that when the paralyzed man had left, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Witnessing a paraplegic immediately get up, couldn't even walk on his own upon command, and that right after having his sins pronounced forgiven, has a way of doing that to people, doesn't it? Beholding such divine glory, the amazed crowd glorified God in now acknowledging that they had never seen anything like this before. What should have been apparent to the religious elite, to the scholars, was very apparent to the rest of the multitudes that this was indeed a work of God. Jesus is who he says he is. Well, brethren, let me conclude our time having considered this event with you by leaving you with a critical application for those of you who are in Christ and a critical application for those of you who are not in Christ as we consider what we've gone over. Having considered the historical reality of what has taken place in this text, brethren, do we not have great reason to rejoice, recognizing that our confidence and hope in Christ are not in vain. Jesus has authority to forgive sins. Jesus has authority to forgive all sins. And those who have laid all of their trust and hope in Christ today are free indeed and will not be ashamed when we cross heaven's finish line. Jesus is not the boxer that somebody has invested all kinds of money in and he puts them in the ring and he puts all of his stock in this boxer and talked all kinds of good things about him and the man goes out and gets knocked out and is ashamed and loses a sense of hope because he's invested in this man. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus has indeed accomplished all of the miraculous things that he did when here on earth. Jesus indeed died for our sins, conquered death, and rose from the dead. When we die, brethren, if we should die before he returns, we will not be ashamed of the hope, the full hope that we've invested in. We can throw all of our trust in Christ. This is our supreme joy. Something that we can bury deep in the treasuries of our hearts. Especially as we trek through the pains and sorrows and disappointments of life. There is something untouchable here. Something seated at the right hand of God that can never be taken from us no matter what we must endure in this life. Our sins are forgiven entirely and completely, all of them in Christ. They cannot cling to you. Now if you're like me, you can look back in your life and you don't have to look very far when you consider the holiness of God, but we can see the ugliness of the things that we have done to offend God. Things that would make us well deserving of hell. We could picture those things in our minds. Things we wish we could erase, but we can't. All of that is forgiven in Christ and no longer clings to you. It doesn't belong to you. And he has buried it in the deepest depths of the ocean. It's as far as the east is from the west are your sins from you. 
There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is no guilt for those who are in Christ. How powerful guilt is. Isn't it powerful? Guilt will sink a ship. There's no guilt. Christ is our immovable link to our most holy and eternal God because in, by, and through him we find our sins completely washed away. He is a chain that cannot be broken. And the moment we try to add a single link to that chain of something of our own righteousness, of our own doings, we've created the weak link that will break the chain. But when it's all of Christ, we have an infallible, untouchable chain that brings us right to God. If you are in Christ, what greater joy could you ever possibly attain to than to know that you stand forgiven and wholly righteous in Christ. And brethren, this needs to be the fountain which we continually, day after day after day, drink from in our meditations, seeking to draw fresh water for today's trials and challenges. We need to drink from that fountain every day. We don't need to be a people that have graduated on to some deeper issues of doctrine. And have left those things of salvation behind. We need the very basic reminder of who we are in Christ. Every single day of our lives. We must stop in the middle of every whirlwind. And say to ourselves and in praise to God. Hallelujah. Christ has all authority to forgive sins. And I am forgiven Holy and completely in him forever and ever and ever, eternity without end. But secondly, if you are not a Christian here this morning, if you have been an unbeliever, you have not fled to the Lord Jesus Christ for hope and his salvation and grace, do you see the profound depth of hope? that is once again put before you here this morning? How will you respond to this news? Jesus has all authority to forgive sins. Some of you may say, you know what? I've I've been offered this hope before in the gospel. I've heard this message and I've spurned it. And I've gone on in my sinful ways. Surely there's no hope for me. God knows that I was as intentional as ever in sinning against him. That I have rebelled right to his face. And there's no hope for me. Jesus is capable, is able, and is willing to forgive your sins even now. But you must repent and come to him in truth. No more games. No more delays. You don't know what a day is going to bring. We just heard about this, we're hearing about still this hurricane that went through Florida. And I know that there have been worse, but for some people, this was a life changing event. People have lost their homes. Some people have died. One day, everything looks so beautiful. Everything is set up. I don't know if you saw those pictures. Some of these cars, it, it, Brilliant $200,000 sports cars just blown through the world, well, tossed with the wind, smashed into other cars and boats and houses torn to shreds. That is representative of this life. That's where we're all heading in this life. Ultimately, we can't hold on to anything. And God can take it away in but a moment. But you can be, you can be secure yourself on a sure foundation if you are in Christ. You must believe into him. All of your guilt can be removed right now. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if you're outside of Christ? Your conscience is, 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 is telling you the truth. You're, you're, you're hurt by it. You're shunning that truth and the guilt is there. It's weighing upon you. But you can have that removed. You can be declared innocent before God. You can be just in the sight of God. Not tomorrow, not next year, not 10 years from now, but right now in Christ. If you will but repent 
and believe the gospel, the Savior who has laid down his life on the cross for sinners and who has risen again from the dead is able to forgive you and to cleanse you of all your sins. He is as able today as he was then. He is as alive today as he was then to be able to forgive you for your sins. May God give you the grace if you're outside of Christ this morning to see that in your present state spiritually you are as this paralyzed man desperately in need of grace and of Christ to raise you up so that you can have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word. <clears throat> we thank you for the great testimony that is given to us here, not only of Christ's power and authority over illness and disease, over this man's paralysis so that he could heal his bones and his muscles instantly, but that he is able to forgive sins. More than anything in the world, that's what we need. A Savior who can heal, can heal us from the curse of our sin. And Father, we ask for those of us who do know you, that you would remind us of these truths and grant us that joy of knowing that we are forgiven in Christ, that we might serve you in that joy. And we ask for those who do not know you today, we pray that even here and now, that through your Spirit you would prick them, make them uncomfortable, and lead them into grace in Christ. And we pray that you'd bless now the supper we take in Christ's name.